Well, I warn you in advance, this is complicated. Originally, this document was planned to be solely a supplement to my previous general fund expenditure and bonding proposals. However, the recently passed federal tax bill required a tremendous effort by Revenue Commissioner Cynthia Bowerly and her department to protect hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans from higher state income taxes, from either fully conforming or not conforming to the federal law. My tax proposal to respond to the federal law changes is almost revenue neutral. For this biennium, it's up $5.7 million, although revenues would increase in the next biennium by $258 million, which gives us a healthy reserve for the future. However, my tax bill would provide 2 million Minnesotans and their families with $316 million of state income tax relief, providing an average state income tax cut of $117. Commissioner Bowerly will explain the mechanics shortly. The February budget forecast projected general fund surpluses at the end of both the current FY1819 biennium and the following 2021 biennium. My supplemental bu budget tax and spending changes would leave the general fund with a $123 million surplus in the current biennium and a $275 million surplus in the following biennium, thus preserving the structural surpluses and the budget integrity, which I have said are so vitally important. MMB Commissioner Myron Franz, who with his team and State Budget Director Margaret Kelly have done such a superb job to integrate the federal changes, will detail my proposals. And they'll also be available this afternoon at 2 o'clock for further questions. This is a supplemental budget of significant individual income tax cuts and modest spending increases whose number one priorities are Minnesotans and their families. I look forward to working with the legislature during the next two months to enact these measures. Commissioner Bowerly. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. The governor and the legislature face important choices about how Minnesota will respond to the 2017 federal tax law for our state. The decisions made this session will impact the state taxes for individuals, families, and businesses across Minnesota. If the Minnesota legislature does nothing to respond to the 2017 federal tax law, 300,000 Minnesota families will pay a total of over $59 million more in state taxes. If the legislature fully conforms to the federal law, more Minnesotans will pay even more. 870,000 Minnesota families would pay 425 million more in state taxes. Instead, the governor's proposal identifies a response to the federal law that prioritizes our commitment to sound fiscal management while also treating Minnesotans fairly, especially low and middle income families. If we pass Governor Dayton's tax bill, Minnesota families will see a $316 million in tax relief. Over 1.9 Minnesota, million Minnesota families will see an average tax cut of $117 and 329,000 families will see an average, in, average tax cut of $160. The governor's plan will cut taxes for over 2 million households, improving family budgets without risking the state's stability, the stability of our state's budget. And we will protect hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans from state tax increases caused by the 2017 federal tax law. The governor's proposal would move Minnesota away from using federal taxable income and replacing it with federal adjusted gross income. Moving Minnesota away from using federal taxable income in favor of adjusted gross income gives Minnesota more control over the fairness of our own taxes and supports the stability of our state's revenue. Minnesotans would keep their current standard deduction, they would keep their personal and dependent exemptions for state purposes, and they would keep the many benefits in itemized and other deductions available under current Minnesota law, including charitable contribution deductions, unreimbursed employee expense deductions, casualty losses, and many more. The governor's bill creates a new non-refundable tax credit for individuals earning less than $140,000 as a single and for married filers earning less than $280,000 per year. 
The new credit, which is designed to make taxes fair for hardworking Minnesotans, would cut taxes an average of $117 for over 1.9 eligible Minnesota families. It provides $60 in a credit per individual on a return, so a family of four would receive a $240 tax credit. In addition, the proposal expands the working family credit. It provides increases to 229,000 Minnesota families, and they would receive an average $160 tax credit. I'm sorry, a tax, a tax cut. This expansion would allow families with up to three dependents to see a larger credit. For businesses, the governor's proposal conforms to many of the provisions in the 2017 federal tax law that businesses have been asking for. For example, it expands the amounts and types of equipment a business can claim as current year expenses under 179 expensing, a provision that many small businesses and farmers rely on and will result in over $100 million in savings for the biennium for those taxpayers. It also expands to the broadened assets available for the bonus depreciation provision, and we'd conform to that with the traditional 80% add back as Minnesota has done for many years. The proposal does not conform to the repeal of the corporate AMT, the estate tax exclusion, or the 20% deduction for pass-through income. The governor's proposal identifies a response to the federal law that prioritizes our commitment to sound fiscal management for the state. This portion of the bill is essentially revenue neutral, while also treating Minnesota families fairly. Finally, Governor Dayton's tax bill would repeal the tax breaks enacted in last year's tax bill that threaten our long-term budget stability. It would roll back tax breaks for big tobacco companies, property tax cuts for the CI levy for businesses, and estate tax cuts for the wealthiest Minnesotans. The governor's 2018 tax bill prioritizes low and middle class families across Minnesota, just as he has done for his entire term as governor. The governor's plan will cut taxes for over 2 million households, improving family budgets without risking the stability of the state's budget. We look forward to working with the legislature to respond to this federal way and a chain to federal law in a way that brings fairness for all Minnesota families. Commissioner Grants. <clears throat> Thank you. Working with Governor Dayton, Budget Director Margaret Kelly, and my hardworking colleagues at Minnesota Management and Budget have approached this budget with a focus on being fair and balanced. And the, gov the budget the governor proposes today is no different. As a result of Governor Dayton's practice of structurally balanced budgeting, Minnesota turned a decade of deficits into a string of budget surpluses, paid back our schools, and built up our rainy day funds to over $2 billion. As a result of our fiscal management, in 2016, one of our credit rating agencies restored Minnesota's AAA credit rating. Today, we are presenting a budget proposal that maintains a balanced budget for this biennium and the next while making key investments in Minnesota. Over the past few weeks, the governor has held press, conference on, press conferences on many of the investments that you, you, that you see in today's budget. From education to health care to ensuring our state pensions are secure, the governor's budget focuses on every corner of the state. Let's do the math. After the February forecast, you can see we have a projected surplus of $329 million for the 2018-2019 biennium, and we have an additional $251 million projected balance in 2020-2021. For right now, I'm going to focus on the 2018-19 biennium and the $329 million starting point. In 2018-19, the governor invests $21 million for safe and secure schools to improve student and school security. These funds will allow districts to make needed safety upgrades to school facilities, hire additional staff resources, and provide school-based grants for mental health services to students who need additional support. The governor invests an additional $26 million in education for a number of programs proven to help our children succeed, including voluntary pre-K, school readiness plus, special education funding, and child care assistance funding. Every step forward we take as a state is tied to the legacy of those who came before, as the governor mentioned in, in his State of the State. An investment of $12 million in 2018-19 will go to protecting seniors and vulnerable adults. Minnesota seniors deserve access to safe, high-quality care at every facility in the state, and they need to know that if something goes wrong, the state will investigate in a timely manner. The governor's budget supports the recommendations of an independent work group convened by AARP Minnesota. Strengthening our licensing, advocacy investigation, and communication systems will help ensure seniors receive the care they need and deserve. 
The governor also proposes $13 million from the general fund in 2018-2019 to support the opioid crisis facing our state. This investment will support high-impact strategies like ensuring first responders have access to naloxone, increasing first responders to, for the opioid abuse to prevent opioid abuse. It also focuses on communities that have been disproportionately affected by the opioid, opioid addiction. The proposal includes the creation of a new opioid stewardship program, which will pay, play a vital part in our efforts to fight this crisis in every community throughout Minnesota. The governor's capital budget released on January 16th recommends $1.5 billion in capital projects around the state. This budget includes $37 million for interest cost of that bonding bill and additional cash for some projects. The governor's bonding bill is a no frills bill that invests in the state's current assets, ensuring Minnesotans continue receiving services they need and experience the high quality of the life they've come to expect. Our debt capacity shows us that we have an ability to fund up to $3.5 billion in available bonding capacity, and the governor's proposal is well below that limit. In higher education, both the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State receive support in this budget. A $30 million investment will allow both institutions to maintain current tuition levels and support Minnesota State's new technology effort. It also includes additional funding through the Office of Higher Education to help students complete their education. The next two investments are particularly important to me as Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. An investment of $27 million in 2018-2019 will help put the pension plans on a path to full funding. This investment will result in a $3.4 billion reduction of the state's unfunded liabilities. From my perspective as the state's chief financial officer, this investment is critical. Pension liabilities are an important component of state finances that our credit rating agencies review every year. Minnesota's growing pension liabilities have been a concern I've heard from the rating agencies each year. With this investment, we are doing right by Minnesotans and safeguarding our state's financial status. In January, 20, uh, six, in January of this year, MMB released a report that assessed the state of Minnesota's sexual harassment prevention policies and procedures. That report was a first of its kind for state governments and made recommendations on how we can prevent sexual harassment in our workplaces, while also strengthening the process of investigating complaints. The governor's budget proposes $6 million to support these recommendations, including the creation of a central office for investigations. This office will help ensure consistency in how we address all complaints of harassment and discrimination. On the chart, this item is included in the all other category. The investments that I covered are just a part of the proposed investments included in the governor's budget. Many of these investments include additional funding in the next biennium. For that information, I refer you to the handouts that you received this morning. <clears throat> the governor's budget will ensure that we end the 2018-19 with a balance. I can't resist, but the math is as simple as one, two, three. You will notice that the, bu the budget balance for the end of the biennium is $123 million. <laughs> I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that any budget passed this session leave a positive balance on the bottom line in this biennium and the next. We must prepare Minnesota for any unexpected economic changes of, or federal policy changes and keep the state on sound financial footing. Thank you. Any questions on this subject? Being done, okay, thank you. Governor, if I look at these numbers, it looks like the $10 million you requested for Minlars is here in the 1819, but I'm having a hard time finding the additional funds requested for Minlars. Um, help us out here. Well, uh, we're proposing to fund uh, part of the additional cost of Minlars by uh, increasing the license uh, fee, the, uh, uh, by, it was $2. You want to elaborate? So that that offsets a good part of the of the funding for both this biennium and the next biennium. Yeah, I'll just mention that the 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 amount you see there is the general fund component. As the governor mentioned earlier in January, the forty three million dollars is made up of both fee revenue from the increase of uh, license fee and from the general fund and existing funds that are already at the Department of Public Safety. Why is zero next year? Yes. Yeah. There's the no next biennium. The next biennium. This will be. Completed in 2018-2019. Commissioner, help us understand, if you will, the 
three rollbacks that the governor is, is proposing of the, the, the tobacco, uh, the business tax breaks, and the estate taxes, and how that, how that foots into all the numbers, because you'll be getting additional revenue into the budget as a result of that. How does that plug in? Help us understand that, if you would. Sure. So as the governor uh, has been saying for over, uh, since we finished last year's session, uh, there are a number of provisions, three provisions from last year's tax bill that he had uh, some concerns about, particularly because of their impact on the long-term uh, state health, uh, fiscal health for the state. Um, the, the estate tax, uh, so the governor in this bill will propose to freeze the estate tax at $2.4 million, uh, reinstate the inflator on the state uh, business tax levy for property taxes, and uh, repeal the uh, tobacco uh, tax cuts that were in the bill. So uh, those total about $15 million in this biennium. Uh, and so that, as the governor mentioned, there's a, there's a package that deals specifically with federal conformity and some other items. And then those three, um, you will see in the, in the MMB documents, are a, a separate line. Is the governor proposing reinstating the inflator on the tobacco tax also? Yes, he is. Are there any other? tax or fee increases in here? There, with respect to taxes, uh, the federal conformity, uh, a number of those provisions, uh, particularly on the business side, will result in a, a, additional revenue. Uh, there will also be tax cuts for businesses that uh, come from conformity as well. But overall, any other for anybody, any other fees, anything else? Also for the uh, and health, uh, elder care, the, uh, the um, assisted living facilities will have a license fee of, what, $15,000 or $11,000, piece, which parallels the nursing home licensing fee of $15,000, again, to help pay for the uh, oversight that we need to provide for, uh, for their services. Any, any other fees that we're aware of? Margaret? <coughs> I think there might be a few small other ones. Escape anything like that? No, no, that, we went through that last year. Yeah, uh, there's a question here. Uh, the license fee increase to pay for Minlar's fixes? For Minlar's, two dollars. Yeah, two dollar license. Two dollar for each uh, vehicle. Two dollars for each vehicle, and not driver's license. Correct. Just, just vehicle. License. Describe page. <laughs> this fee was previously in effect, and it's suns. The fee was previously in effect, and it was sunset in 2008. It's the same fee that funded the current project, but it's sunset in 20, 2008 or 2010. So it's on driver's license applications, duplicate and renewal transactions, and motor vehicle title applications and registration renewals. Governor, you seem to be setting up a push and pull here where if there's going to be tax breaks for people, the middle income, it's going to come out of the business side. Well, the fact we're taking the federal tax bill, which reduced the corporate income tax by 40%. Uh, that's a huge tax reduction for businesses in Minnesota. And we have, uh, even though I'm proposing to re rescind the uh, t property tax break that was provided for Minnesota businesses last, last session, uh, anyway, they have it for now, and that's another significant tax cut. Uh, by contrast, the you know, individual Minnesotans did not receive much, if any, benefit from the federal tax bill, low and middle income citizens. So this is a way of, of balance, balancing it out. And we're just, you know, not, we're not um, raising taxes, per se, on corporations. We're just conforming or not conforming to some of the different provisions, according to creating a balanced and fair budget. What's your argument then for Republicans who liked a lot of these provisions in the tax bill? How will you talk them into repealing what they forced you to sign? Well, I want to see their I want to see their tax bill. I mean, they've been waiting for mine. That's fair. So now let's see their tax bills and see what they're proposing to do. You know, again, this is was very complex, and factoring all these federal changes, which <laughs> we didn't wish for, 
but uh, are dealing with and trying to protect and successfully protecting uh, Minnesota individual income taxes and families, as uh, Commissioner Bowerly said, if we conformed, we'd have significant tax increases for hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans. If we didn't conform, we'd have the same for another hundred thousand, several hundred thousand. So, I mean, this is a very a complicated way of trying to fit all of these different factors into the, uh, the equation, and as well as with the corporate and the. Uh, this is what we came out with. If they wanted to try something different, they're welcome to do so, and we'll see what they come up with. Governor, how about one of your biggest line items there, safe schools, education? Can you talk about, obviously, that wasn't something you were planning on looking at this year, particularly the safe schools. One of the biggest single items, talk about the necessity of that. Well, the uh, intention here is to provide grants to local school districts that they can use so that they, they can... Uh, decide for themselves what, what, what kind of safety measures they need. And that could be, uh, you know, it could be whatever they decide is, is most appropriate for their, their schools. That's the primary uh, funding there. Do you think that'll be bipartisan in one of the I think so. sleds here? I, I'm hopeful. Yes, I believe it will. Governor, do the 335 beds that you're adding to prisons include the 105 that DOC has requested for Lionel Lakes and Willow River? Because my understanding is that you encourage them to put that request forward, but that you hadn't actually signed off on their $65 million budget request. Well, I've been persuaded that this is the imperative. Does it include Lionel Lakes and... Uh... It's not actually adding beds. It's just paying for the people that are coming into the prisons. Oh. Many of them are being... Going primarily into the county jails. Yep. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's not a permanent solution, but it's uh, one that we need to imp implement immediately because we uh, don't have the state prison space uh, right now. Is there a price tag on that? I don't know if I caught that. Thank you. Seven point eight million. Governor, could this proposed fee on vehicles potentially derail the Minlars fix, given that the, the House position has been? to hold the executive branch uh, uh, accountable to absorb that cost. I'm not going to sign that bill. I'm not going to cannibalize other state agencies uh, to you know, pay for the, the, the problems with Minlars. And I just think that's a, that's a petty gimmick. Uh, we, they set agency budgets last year. We thrashed that out. We're operating within those budgets, and we intend to do so for the next uh, nine months. And, um, you know, Minlar is a separate issue, a separate problem, which, uh, again, I've taken responsibility for, but we're not going to jeopardize other functions that state government agencies perform for, for the citizens of Minnesota. On that note, why should the citizens of Minnesota have to continue paying more for technology that your administration failed to launch? No. We can leave it the way it is if that's, you know, that's not a viable alternative. I, I apologize to Minnesota taxpayers for the additional cost. It's, a, it's an enormous system. It was one, talk about a private contractor, we looked into that a couple of stages. There's no private uh, vendor that's capable of uh, providing uh, or producing this kind of system. So they had parceled it out and they you know, had different uh, subcontractors take different pieces of it. And it hasn't yet come together. You know, Minsher didn't roll out perfectly because, again, a massive system statewide, and now just uh, three years later, is functioning uh, very, very efficiently, near perfectly. I have no doubt this will be the same. Uh, and and these rollouts of major changes uh, to, a, in this case, a system that was 30 years old. We couldn't find we couldn't find a vendor to repair the system that uh, they were using, just uh, nobody was doing it anymore. So there really it wasn't, wasn't an option and we did our best and it fallen short and we need more money to fix it. We'll fix it if we have the money. And um, in a short period of time, longer period of time, we don't get the funding, it'll be corrected. So what have you accomplished by firing the person running the program? Well, I'm not gonna comment, it's a personnel matter, I'm not gonna comment. Governor, on, on the issue of the three items that you'd like to see repealed. That was the heart of the dispute, your dispute with Republicans that went to court and played out as it, as it played out. But forgive me for asking it this way, but 
why do you think that it will turn out any differently this time? It's clear that they're very adamant on this based on the history of what happened in, in terms of the legal dispute. We are forgiven. <laughs> uh, very fair question. You know, I, I, this is my budget proposal, tax and spending proposal. Uh, how they respond to it remains to be seen. And again, if they don't want to uh, restore those revenues, then uh, that affects uh, the overall balance to the budget that I have. And well, again, it's, it's incumbent on them now who disagree with mine to propose their own. And now we have two months left in the session and plenty of time for uh, all the, the different views to be set forth and uh, debated and discussed and then passed by the, the May 22nd, 20 what? Yeah. 21st. The Appleton prison issue has come back. It, won't, it won't passed through the House uh, Government Finance Committee. One of the things that they're arguing is that they need it because you're, you're use, using so many county jail beds, and now you're talking about adding apparently 335 more. Isn't that sort of feeding into their argument that we need a new prison? Well, uh, actually, the Department of Corrections reduced by 200 its, its uh, projection. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, that we're, we're crowded, although the, the county, uh, some uh, five of the county jails are uh, renting space out to uh, the federal government for ICE to d detain uh, people they've picked off the streets. So uh, it's a mixed situation in terms of the uh, capacity that exists. Uh, you know, Appleton is a major expenditure to buy it and to rehabilitate it and then to operate it. And you know, that's, I'm, not, I'm gonna try to avoid making any commitments that are going to uh, saddle the next administration with uh, these you know, very expensive projects and undertakings. If they want to look at it, they should look at it next year and consider it in light of whatever the uh, projections are at that time and uh, you know, debate it from that point on. But I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to agree to something that's going to have, would have major capital and operating costs uh, when we don't need it right now. So you're saying you would veto that bill if it somehow got through the legislature? I would, I, I don't support it. Is there money in here to upgrade the elections system to keep it secure? Uh, yes. Everyone's not in their heads, go ahead. Yeah, there is money to help the Secretary of State in the program to upgrade based on some of the concerns they're getting around uh, the country about upgrading the capacity. So there is some money for the Secretary of State's office. More than a million? It's less than a million, but I don't have the... I'll, I'll it's, get the what he it's what he asked for. Yeah. It's what he asked for. He got funding last year, too, for uh, upgrades, and that needs to continue, certainly. Commissioner Bauer, can you run through some of the, the major um, tax increases that um, and provisions that would hit some Minnesota businesses through your conformity bill? Sure. First, I'll start with... Um, so the business on the business sort of side of the conformity questions, uh, for businesses, there's a couple of things that we have to keep in mind is that um, for many businesses, it's very difficult to have two sets of books essentially for the federal, their federal taxes and their state taxes. So when we were looking at these provisions, we also have been hearing from businesses when I've been meeting with the Chamber of the Business Partnership uh, and farming groups, we've been hearing how important uh, 179 expensing is, which basically allows businesses to take in a full year of purchasing an asset uh, to take that depreciation instead of spreading that over time. So that results in a tax cut. Uh, the bonus depreciation, which we are not allowing for the full expensing, but allowing that Minnesota traditional add back while we are giving them access to the full conformed uh, set of assets at the federal level. Um, and so those are, are tax cuts as well. For, uh, particularly for small businesses, the uh, federal law changed some accounting treatment uh, and allows small businesses in particular to choose a more preferential accounting treatment, so that reflects as a tax reduction. We also just don't think it's practical for businesses to have two sets of books in terms of how they're doing their accounting. Um, I would say the same is true for something like net operating losses, which will result in uh, additional revenue for the state by conforming to that, but it, it would be virtually, it would be very difficult for businesses to have, to track separately for federal purposes and state purposes, their net operating losses. Um, another provision that will increase state revenue is uh, the treatment for interest deduction. Um, at the uh, federal level, uh, currently under, under both uh, laws, 
businesses were allowed to deduct 100% of their interest. The federal law limits that to 30% for large businesses. Businesses with uh, gross revenue under $25 million will still be allowed the full 100%. So we're proposing conforming to that, which also does raise some revenue. Uh, the other additional revenue raised is largely from the foreign uh, treatment. So uh, the federal government is uh, deeming uh, to be repatriated money that corporations have been holding overseas. So uh, this proposal conforms to that and allows uh, that to uh, be paid over eight years as the federal government does. Uh, and so there is additional revenue raised there. One of the larger single items is border-to-border -border broadband. Could you talk a little bit more about why you want to put money into that, why that's important? Well, you can ask uh, people in uh, various parts of greater Minnesota who still don't have access. You know, if we want people to be able to live and work all over the state, which we do, then one of the essential uh, prerequisites is to have a high-speed broadband internet and, and I would say also cell phone coverage. And those who have it can, can operate uh, worldwide, and those who don't are s uh, seriously handicapped. So I know I, I, when I ran in 2010, I said border to border, cell phone and high speed internet coverage. We're inching our way there. Uh, the legislature hasn't provided all the funding that requested. Uh, we have really an excellent uh, program underway, but it just needs the resources to fund. Uh, the underserved and unserved areas. I heard yes. a couple of times, I'm not sure who said it, but I heard it twice, the 316 million, but it says uh, 319 million in tax relief. Is it 316 or 319? It's 319. It's 319. Oh, it, it is 319. It's 319. And, um, I'm trying to flip through here too. I think uh, you had mentioned, Governor, that there was an $11,000 licensing fee for assisted care facilities. Is that higher or lower? Is is it 15,000 now? 15,000 for nursing homes. There's no license. There's no licensing at all for assisted living now, okay. and so there's no licensing fee. So this would both require them to be licensed and uh, require them to pay a $11,000 fee. That's per year. That's per year or per biennium? licensing and the cost in the following years, I believe, is lower. As, as you isn't it a tradition to have agency, have the businesses being regulated help pay the cost of the regulation? Isn't that how we do business in Minnesota anyway? Uh, well, that's a, a good approach. I mean, we're pay, I don't think individual taxpayers should pay for the cost of, uh, for example, licensing of social living when it's been proven now that that absence of licensing, absence of oversight, is a big uh, cons contributor to the problems that have been identified. Okay. okay. And then to be continued uh, to. Meanwhile, sir. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Your elder abuse uh, protecting vulnerable adults number is lower than from your news conference the other day. What happened? Well, don't let the commissioner friends leave quite yet then. It's the same proposal, but they just refined the numbers, and particularly around IT. Particularly around what? IT. <coughs> EIS for the Enbridge Line 3, and you like that or not? You know, the, the, the decision making now is, is properly within the province of the Public Utilities Commission, which fortunately through the real wise foresight of legislators uh, decades ago was set up as a totally independent entity from the legislature and from uh, Myself and the executive branch, except the Department of Commerce, who provides information, and I'm going to respect that. You know, the uh, adequacy of the EIS means that the consideration can go forward, but it doesn't constitute approval. If they now are going to decide on, on the basis of certificate of need whether this uh, line is needed for Minnesota's purposes, and that'll be a decision made uh, now. It's estimated in June, and if if Hypothetically, that were to be approved, then it would still need to go through the permitting process of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the, and the DNR. And uh, 
That is something that we'd look at down the road. Are you comfortable, Governor, with the routes that are being considered, route or routes that are being considered that they're respectful of the Native Americans' interests in this? That was the intent. I, I can't say definitively, but I believe that they are uh, routed around uh, the tribal lands. Any other questions? Yeah, we, we've seen the reemergence of the, the uh, freeway protest bill uh, yesterday, I think it was. I, I think last year you said that you were considering it. I think you wanted to think about it more, but you've had a year. Um, do you support that at this point after having time to really look into that? Well, I, I said last year that I uh, would, in a very limited way, support if uh, people are, are blocking freeways or airport access. Uh, that, that endangers public safety and endangers law enforcement. If it were something limited to that, I would consider it. But last year, it got to be a broader swipe at, at every you know, legitimate First Amendment of protest. So we'll have to see how it comes out. If they get an exercise, though, and I think it's a proper discipline in the measure, you know, we'll, I'll look at it. I'm not committing to it, but I'll look at it. But if they don't, then if it's just going to be another swipe, if it's going to be just another election year, to try to you know, scare Minnesotans that certain people are a danger to society if it's going to get into that kind of realm. And I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't want anything to do with it. Governor, how did, uh, how did Hugo react to this year's State of the State? <laughs> you know, he was vibrating afterward. He was bouncing up and down. Uh, he, uh, I, you know, he'll be five next week and he won't remember consciously any of this. So I'm, I'm really hoping subliminally you know, he'll have a sense that his, his uh, he calls me Bumpa. His Bumpa did something worthwhile for her, at least part of his life. Uh, it was very special to me to have him there. Governor, legislators have introduced bills to ban cities from using ranked choice voting. Do you, what do you think of those? Do you like that system? Yeah, I, I just read about that too. These things are now starting to pop up. Uh, I think ranked rank choice voting has worked well in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, you know, they have uh, uh, homogenous uh, voting machines and the like. And so, you know, I, I think it's challenged candidates to be respectful of one another and if not, to suffer the consequences where somebody's going to opt for somebody else. So, uh, you know, I, I, think it, I think it's worked. It hasn't, uh, one concern was it was going to delay for days or weeks, the conclusion of elections. So far, that hasn't happened. So, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I don't see a reason to, to uh, prevent local governments from exercising that authority. Governor, the Senate delayed its in, vote. Are you going to be involved in Minlar's negotiations this weekend? Not, not this weekend that I know of. I mean, my staff may be. I don't, that, I, I know they, the Senate considered it yesterday and then they wanted to carry it over next week. What they're doing this week, uh, see, uh, oh, I don't know what, what their intentions are. If they want to discuss it this week, I'm certainly, I'm around, and my staff is, we'll, we're available 24-7 for the next two months. But if they want to discuss it further, we're glad to do so. The time is of the essence. We're halfway through March now. And uh, as I said before, without that funding, some people have already left. Others are preparing to leave. And it's going to really cripple our ability to make progress if that funding isn't provided, well, two weeks ago. Senate yeah. leaders said yesterday that they delayed the vote because you had made a proposal for some changes. Can you talk about I that proposal? That we said, so it said 11 o'clock last I just saw the news report, 11 o'clock last night, we sent massive changes. That was an amendment that Senator Dibble was working on. Okay. So it was. It's we were apprised of that. I'm not disavowing any involvement with it, but it was, it was his amendment, and he wanted to uh, substitute that for the existing uh, Senate bill, and that was carried over. But so I, I don't know. If it's accurate to say that that it came from from my administration, and it didn't come at 11 o'clock last night. At least nobody told me, and I was up till past midnight. <laughs> Governor, do you support um, the renewed push to pass solitary confinement reform this year? Uh, I absolutely would uh, support the reforms. I'm not aware of the particulars, but I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's brutal. And, it, you know, it, it, 
may be necessary as a, a inmate control a tool, but it's uh, it's got to be used very, very selectively. And to, to have people leave from solitary confinement right into society when they're paroled is just really asking uh, them to make a, an almost impossible leap back into society. So yes, I would uh, very much be very interested in, in the reforms. So. Uh, yesterday in the public safety, several bills were laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Um, I, I talked to the chair, he said that it would be sort of the opposite of last year. A lot of policy, a little bit of f financing, but I'm wondering what your reaction is that uh, you don't seem to be in love with these omnibus bills. Well, it's, it's, it's a device, uh, first of all, some people say it violates the Constitution that only one subject per bill. Uh, leading that aside, I don't tend to go into legal processes again. But it's just, you know, it's just a, it's just a ploy to force, try to force me to accept things that I oppose. And rather than debating each one up and down on its own merits. And if they send them to me in a timely base fashion, uh, I have, you know, have to sign it or let it become law or veto it. And then they can go back and we can discuss it. If they're going to put everything off to the last 11th hour and 59th minute as they have before and then roll it all in omnibus bills and dump them on me and we're going to have problems. Okay. Thanks everybody. Good. Thank you.